Hi everyone and welcome uh, to our SIA and EY webinar, Doing Safety Differently. This is our fourth webinar in the series. Hopefully some of you have been to our earlier webinars this year on mental health, compliance and on safety culture. I'm really excited about the topic today. We're looking at how we manage health and safety in a challenging environment of change. And uh, in the discussion today, we're going to be talking about two key topics. The key changes impacting our profession as safety professionals and the readiness of industry to respond to those changes. And we're also going to be looking at the future role of the safety professional. So what is our role going to be in this future state? I have some wonderful people joining me today for the webinar. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Richard Coleman. Richard um, has, after nearly 30 years in executive safety, HR and operational roles, He's built a wealth of experience about what works and what doesn't work in changing organisational culture. His previous roles include GM of HSE for Asiano and Director of Health Safety Environment at Telstra. Richard has extensive experience in leadership, occupational health, occupational learning and executive management. He has a BA in Industrial Relations and Political Science from UNSW. I'm also from there, so excellent. And he's got a master's degree in OHS from the University of Sydney, which is the wrong uni. Um, I'd really like to welcome Richard to the stage. Hi, Richard. How are you? I'm very well, Andy. Thank you for that, uh, that lovely introduction. Thank you for joining us. I also have Dr. Drew Ray with me today, and some of you may have uh, seen um, Drew speak at the recent SIA conference. Um, he's an associate editor of the journal Safety Science and a manager of the Safety Science Innovation Lab at Griffith University. Drew's research brings a critical cross-disciplinary approach to the examination of myths, rituals and bad habits that surround safety practice. Drew's recent publications challenge the common assumption that risk assessments and incident investigations lead to safer work. He suggests alternative bases around better understanding the constraints that prevent safe innovation and the resources that support successful work. Thank you very, very much, Drew, for being here today as well. Hi, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. Finally, I am welcoming Amy from my team onto the stage as well. For those of you who dialed in last time, we had Nicole from my team join us. I have Amy here today um, helping make sure everything goes smoothly. Uh, Amy is a senior manager in my team and uh, she specialises in risk governance, culture and strategy. She's worked with property and the energy sectors as well as government. She's much more tactful than I and so it works well. Um, She's got uh, a keen interest actually in data and how we can use data and information to improve our governance and reporting processes. So I'm sure she will have a lovely uh, conversation with Richard and Drew who I understand are also very focused on that side of things. So thank you very much Amy for being here to support today. In terms of the process for today, just so uh, the audience knows, we do have a Twitter handle. Oh, I, there you go, Twitter handle. And I think it's at the bottom of your screens as well. So please feel free to use that um, at any time to share your comments or questions. The way that we've run previous webinars and the way that I would like to run this webinar is somewhat informal. This is a conversation. So whilst we have a topic and some questions for our lovely uh, panel members today, I'd be very keen for the audience to also provide us with questions. You have a text box on the left hand side of your screen and you can type your messages in there. I have Sophie from my team sitting here ready to make sure that we see all of your questions and I can pose them to our panellists as we go. So please don't wait for a Q&A session at the end or anything like that. This is a conversation and I'd love you all to participate. So on that note, to kick off the conversation, I think uh, the first topic is around what are the key changes, what are we seeing uh, that might hit us in terms of the future. And I'll post this, Richard, I might start with you and then we can throw to Drew for an answer as well, but what do you see are the impacts on health safety more generally in, in industry and in business from changes that are happening 
whether that be digital disruption and technology or data or other changes that the future of work will bring. Yeah, okay. I, um, I think there are enormous changes impact, potentially impacting a whole range of Australian, Australian businesses. Those, those changes range from you know, increasing globalisation, um, you know, political, political issues, um, political strategic issues globally. It's a whole range of things. My my personal interest, though, is particularly in and around the digital disruption space. And when I when I talk digital disruption, I mean the coming together of um, a whole range of technologies from uh, big data. And I know that Drew doesn't like that that term, so I'm interested in understanding why. Um, you know, the the coming together of multiple data sets over multiple diff different platforms, the rise of artificial intelligence, social media, and the role that it plays within the walls of a particular business, um, virtual reality and augmented reality, smart devices and wearables, and what what's often referred to as the Internet of Things. Those things coming together um, and impacting businesses. They're already impacting businesses today, but over the next five to ten years. I think it's fundamentally going to shift both business models and employment relations um, across most across most Australian industry sectors. And so, when you see that shift, do you want to just delve into it a little bit? What do you think that impact looks like, from your view? Um, I, I think there's two kind of key critical impacts, and, and, and particularly in terms of the focus of, of this webinar. One is around how business models will, will, will change. The classic example that people often refer to is the sort of the Airbnb and, and, and Uber. Airbnb, the world's biggest provider of rooms and accommodation, doesn't own a single, a single uh, room itself. Uber doesn't own a sing, single car. It, it, it simply is just, it's just a platform through which people, people do business. So you're going to start seeing platform changes to multiple organisations. That means that our traditional model of you go to work in a business that has all the bricks and mortar and all the equipment and everything's done within the kind of four walls of that business is falling apart. So you're going to have situations where a business will own intellectual property, its equipment will be owned by somebody else, potentially in a, in a d different location. It may not have permanent employees, it may have multiple contingent labour across, across the globe. That's a different world in which safety professionals have to drive to the outcomes that they, that they want to drive to. Um, and how we think about our role in that world is very different to how we think about it today. The systems and the processes and the controls and everything that we've kind of pulled together do not work in an environment where everything is disaggregated. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, hearing that, Drew, I'd love you to chime in now with your views because I think um, I, I personally agree quite strongly with Richard. The world, the world is changing and our people aren't going to be in offices, potentially even in the same country. Uh, we're not going to have employees necessarily. We're going to have workers that work for multiple organisations in multiple ways. I'd be very keen from your perspective in terms of um, what you see uh, the impact being. Uh, I think Richard is absolutely right about the types of changes that we've seen recently and are going to see more in the future. I'm not so sure that change itself is such a new thing. What's new is that 20 or 30 years ago, we didn't have a safety industry of the sort of size we have now. And so this is one of the first times that the safety industry has had to adapt through a time of change. And we don't have a ready defined identity as to what role we play. Is our job to be the conservatives? Are we supposed to be the forces fighting against change saying, no, 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 don't do that. that risky, that hasn't been properly scoped out, that hasn't been thought through. No, you can't have your new driverless cars. No, you can't have your new use of data because we haven't made sure it's safe yet. Is our role to play catch up, to be submitting safety cases for the new program three years after they've been implemented and thrown away? Or is our job to actually be champions and facilitators of change, which is kind of uncomfortable since really our role is inherently conservative, thinking about the risks, the problems with things, rather than thinking about the opportunities. So 
it's a pretty uncomfortable identity situation to be in. You mentioned that our role has been traditionally conservative and, and, and we have rightly or wrongly been known as the police, um, the, the compliance machine, but is there a change in that role um, in terms of you know, a demand for us not to be in that space and maybe the, the changes we see, that we see that are coming are a window of opportunity for us to, to fulfil maybe a more valuable role or a different role? That's a good question and I'd be pretty arrogant to think that I had the absolute answer to it. Ah, oh, really? Uh, I was hoping you had all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> I think simple survival um, within the future business environment requires us to either change or disappear. We're already seeing that the role of the generalist safety professional is less necessary simply because we've done our job well. Shop floor supervisors these days have as much understanding of safety as their safety advisors had 15 years ago. They don't need someone whispering in their ear about machine guarding, about think about safety because it's important. I think businesses still do need strong strategic advice on safety. They still need assistance in passing information around on closing the gap between leadership and frontline work and there's a role to be filled there if safety professionals want it. If we don't want it, someone else is going to fill that gap. But where we go instead, I think, is up for grabs. So, Richard, from your perspective, do you think we're actually ready as an industry for the change that's going to happen? Uh, no, I don't. And I think, um, I think the change is fundamentally different, right? So. Um, I like to think about it, you know, one of the terms in physics is when you move from one state of matter to another, it's a phase change, right? So the example would be you move from ice to water, that's a phase change. Move from water to water vapour, that's, that's a phase change. And I, I think work's actually going through that now. It's the change that I experienced through my career to date has all been just the water getting warmer. You know, so if things have moved, things have moved faster. We've tried to do things cheaper. We've been focused on productivity. We've maybe introduced some new technology. We've done all these kind of things, right? But essentially, the the, the change in business has been essentially essentially linear. I think things are about to change and become very different in, in the way that work is work work is delivered. And one of my big concerns is that whenever you talk change not whenever, but often when you talk change to a safety person, they'll start saying, no, it's okay, I understand change. We've got a change management standard and a change management process. Um, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about making sure that you put that valve in the system the right way round and what happens if you don't get that right. That's what a change management standard, a change management process is essentially written for. I'm talking about getting involved in the fundamental redesign of industries and business and work as, as we move forward. And I, I really agree with Drew. It's a different, it's a very different role. And then Drew, do you have any other thoughts around that area as well in terms of the change and how, how the role's really gonna change around the industry? I guess the other aspect, and I'd be interested to hear Richard's thoughts on this, is that the delivery of new business models doesn't just apply to core services, but to safety itself. Um, the types of things that safety people do are just as amenable to those types of changes. Uh, we already have, for example, far more virtual teams in safety now people who were once sharing a desk in the same office who are now managing safety of people who are out in the Simpson Desert while they're sitting in Brisbane. Um, we have access to more data and different types of data. Um, access to more tools simply for sharing information between businesses and for outsourcing of services that we didn't have before. Richard, do you have a response for Drew in, in, in that? Yeah, I absolutely do. I think the job, so you know, if you went to go and study with Drew 20 odd years ago or some other university, you were told quite rightly, well done, you've made a great career choice, there's lots of work here for you and here's, 
here, learn how to do a risk assessment here, uh, understand how an OHS management system works, now go out in industry and you know, uh, be an evangelist, ev evangelist for this stuff. Um, I think the role now is a change support agent. It's about bringing humanity to the technology that, 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 that's coming. So for example, um, one of the technologies I talk a lot about is sort of artificial intelligence, right? And artificial intelligence is very good at kind of understanding masses of data um, and creating um, uh, predictive models about how the world's potentially going to work next. Human beings over the top of that create a better, a better outcome. Human beings are actually pretty good at dealing, we're not perfect, we're pretty good at dealing with complexity, we're pretty good at understanding when something is kind of about to go wrong versus not, a, not about to go wrong. We're creative, we take things tangentially, so we've got, a, we've got a picture of the world and all of a sudden we go, actually it'd be really cool if we went over here. Um, uh, those, those, those very human skills, those very human kind of um, neurological constructs, if you like, the things that make us who we are, um, are the things that safety people are going to have to learn, understand and play a role in the implementation of technology as it, as it, as it hits. You raise a good point, Richard. I think you and I were at the same conference in Melbourne where they were talking about the skill sets of the future and creativity and, and uh, the arts and humanities actually, language and that type of thing was, was raised as a key area separate to what I think we hear a lot about which is the STEM, science, technology, engineering skill set, also very important but I was actually really excited to see uh, a recognition of the humanities as being a critical part of the future. Um, one of the things that I believe is that the safety role will still be required for that people interaction and for the creativity and the innovation. Are we ready to fill that role? Do we have the skill sets as safety people uh, to I guess be creative and innovative or is that something that we should be looking to upskill in considering I went through the safety science degree and it was mostly technical content. No, no one really taught me there about design thinking or how to communicate or how to problem solve. There's one, sorry, you can go ahead. No, no, you please go. Go, Joe. Uh, one thing that I'd like to sort of mention just before we move on to answering that question is that one of the things we've been very bad at in the past is trying to work out exactly what humans are good at. Uh, there was a guy called Fitz came up with a thing called Fitz List in the 1950s, which was uh, things that men are better at and things that machine are better at. And if you look back at it now, the number of things it got wrong, uh, <laughs> machines, he said, were much worse at things involving complex numerical calculations particularly things involving real numbers rather than integers. Machines were much worse at doing things repetitively over and over. These were the core human skills, number crunching and repetition. And this is what we're discovering with new methods of data analytics is some things like pattern matching that we thought, well, this is human's key edge is we see patterns better than computers can. And then suddenly we discover that actually, no, we can't. what we're really good at <laughs> is teaching computers how to do things better than we can. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'm a little bit cautious about this idea that there are sort of core human skills that must have a human involved. But if there's anything where we still have the edge in computers, it is with really traditional stuff like storytelling yeah. and interaction human to human. Um, we're better at pretending to be human than I think machines ever will be. Hopefully. I think you raise a really good point there and, and Cameron in our audience has actually asked the question, what do we think the soft skill sets are that are, are required by the industry? And um, he then goes, uh, Cameron, I think you've answered it. I mean, you mentioned user experience, design and problem solving. Storytelling, Drew, is one that I think we, we don't talk about enough within the safety profession and yet it is one of the most powerful learning tools that we have as humans. And, and, and it's been shown for generations across all cultures, in all countries, in all languages, the power of storytelling. Uh, Richard, what's your view when it comes to that as a skill set we're going to need? Uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, 
the word I'm looking for. I'm a very big fan of the concept of, uh, of, of storytelling as a, as a very important component of what safety people, safety people do. Um, the, you know, you've, you've heard me talk in the past about the Leading Home Safely Every Day program that Asiano uh, ran and a critical component of that was actually getting people to explain to others why the broad topic of health safety environment was important to them through the power of story. So what is your story? Why is it important to you now? And, and part of that was making sure that it wasn't all the, you know, the doom and gloom, well, this bad thing happened to someone. You know, we can kind of make stories that are positive, engaging. They, talk, they go to our values, they go to um, what, what drives us, and they, um, they bring people with us on a particular journey. Um, we don't have time for me to tell to, for, for me to tell you mine, but suffice, suffice to say, um, it is an event. It is a um, a thing that happened to me in my career that drives me, you know, today. And it happened 15 odd years ago. And that story is something that stays with me. And I think when I tell it to others, it stays stays with them as well. Absolutely. And I know a lot of the time. When I interact, whether it's at events or in training sessions or executive workshops, it is the stories that capture people and engage them and get them in, in on the conversation. It's very rarely just the facts and the and the uh, the morning tea, although the morning tea can help. Um, but the narrative and the why that comes through a story and the emotion that comes through a story can be very powerful. Um, I have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, around data and digital. And I'm not going to start with Richard because I know he's passionate about it. I'm actually going to throw to Drew first. Um, and this question came from Ying Ho. Uh, and I think it links to another question by Andrew. So let me pose both of them at the same time. The first one, do you think digitalizing safety management would be a threat to the conservative safety industry? And Andrew's question is around the focus on smart data rather than big data and using data to improve safety outcomes. So I think if I summarise the two, do we think digital and data are a threat or should we be taking them on as an opportunity? I'm going to immediately challenge the premise of linking the two together because okay. I think that digital and data cover two different aspects. One of them is about capturing inside an electronic system the way we are currently doing things. Yeah. And it's a really good test as to what things can actually be disrupted and replaced when you can take your job and turn it into an electronic workflow. It looks like you're making your job easier. What you're actually demonstrating is that you don't need a human to do the job at all. Um, one of the reasons I said that safety management is inherently conservative is traditional safety management systems are actually designed as dampening feedback loops. They're designed to keep things in the present state to stop it from drifting, to stop it from changing, and then to only allow change under carefully controlled circumstances. And you could use new technology to capture that and to preserve that and make it harder and harder for people to disrupt and change their business by storing it in electronic systems and making their job uh, locked into the automation. Data, on the other hand, works in the opposite direction. Data frees you to look at new things, to close gaps, to discover ways of doing things. Um, and so that's why I disambiguate them. They're both facilitated by technology, but they have a very different mindset and very different opportunities. And yes, I think they both challenge traditional safety just by showing that a lot of what we're currently doing doesn't need a human to do it. But a lot of what we can do in the future needs both data and humans working together. Before I get your thoughts, Richard, I just want to comment, because in a recent um, article that EY released, I think at the safety conference in September, we talked about the importance of knowledge flow. And the reason we didn't talk about data, be that smart data or big data, is because it's more than just the data, isn't it? It's actually about knowledge and how we can capture and effectively use information, not just the data points in and of themselves. Um, it's actually what you gain in terms of insight and knowledge from that information. That is equally as important to the technology of just the data. Um, Richard, your thoughts. Impact of digital and, and 
separately impact of data, threat or opportunity? So I think it's a absolute threat to individuals within the within the profession. There are within most big businesses, you look at the layers of safety people, the number of safety people, and the things that they're actually doing, and most of it we could we could get rid of today um, with technology. However, um, it may not be economically viable, so people are probably still in their roles for a little while. But on the other hand, I think it's a massive opportunity for for the aim that we're we're about. Right? We if we're actually genuinely about re reducing trauma, uh, injury, death, and suffering, which is kind of why I got into this in, into this game, then this technology gives us an, an incredible opportunity to do that. Um, it still requires, and this is where we get back to that impact on the profession, it's still going to require people, to, in, in, in Drew's language, to be really good at being people. And pretend, sorry, pretending to be people more than computers can pretend to be people. And doing the, the consultation, the implementation, the discussion, the, 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 bringing, the bringing together of the necessary critical mass of people to make, to make change. Technology on its own doesn't make change. Technology and people together within the kind of supporting culture drives change. So a threat to many traditional roles, an opportunity to drive better, better, better outcomes, and an opportunity for, for um, a subset of the kind of skills that, that we have. So Amy, listening to that, and, and I think thinking through some of the projects you've worked on where we've tried to um, explore the role of reporting and access of information. What do you think is the future role of data? So I think data is really, really important to the future of safety and I think it's really important around what are we actually reporting on to start with. So are we actually reporting on the right metrics going forward and, and the way that the world is changing around health and safety? Are we still talking about health and safety versus we're talking about business as well? So I think in terms of the future of reporting, it's more what are we reporting and how are we actually reporting that information and how are we engaging with our executive and our board around what's happening in the world of health and safety or what's happening in business that has safety as a lever. So when we're reporting to the board, what are the really interactive and engaging ways we can actually use digital technology to provide that information upwards. Similarly, when we're getting information and, and doing things within the field, are we making sure that we're using the right technology that the people on the field actually understand and can use? So I think there's a bit of both from that side of things around the governance perspective and making sure that we're reporting the right information up, but that the exposure and the experience that the board and the executive are actually getting makes them understand the information that's going forward too. May I pick up on something that Amy just mentioned about boards interacting with data? People have started now to study how well boards make use of data analytics and aggregation of metrics. And one of the big things that's emerging is the idea of disfluency, that actually people make better decisions and get better outcomes from using data if you don't process and pack it up shut with them. That um, getting a board to play with raw data and raw graphs for themselves may in fact result in better understanding than presenting them a lovely infographic that has everything pre-processed and telling a neatly concise story presented to them. I think that's good insight, Joe. I, I think there's a, a gap between so well packaged that it's almost too easy to just read and put aside and you don't have to think about it, uh, and some of what I heard Amy say, which is, are we actually talking about the right things? Even if we keep it as a standalone agenda, are we talking about the right things, knowing that we could potentially, using the data that's available, explore relationships in a new way? So we're, we're still majority constrained by looking at incident data. Should we be? My, my personal view, no. There's so many other points of data available. But there is still a shift there before you get to how you then package it in a digital media as well. Richard, you, you had an emotional reaction then. I saw it cross your face. Oh, did I? Uh, 
I don't know whether I did, but anyway, um, I, I think that there's there's another layer here that that we need to we need to think about, and it's not. I don't think when I talk about data, I'm not talking about how many knee injuries, how many back injuries, whether it was a guarding incident, you know, manual handling. Oh, that's not what I what I'm talking about at all. I'm much more talking about the disruption that comes when vast amounts of operational data is married with real-time video, real-time audio, um, uh, Twitter, Twitter feeds, Facebook, Facebook posts, um, the geolocation of every individual and every piece of plant, the condition of every piece of plant, you know, it's operating within its whole range of operating parameters and you owe, and, and the, the, the geography, the weather, everything in real time is actually understood and, uh, and monitored and managed and people interact with that data through some sort of platform. That's when our world really, really changes. I'm talking with mute on. That's not going to work, is it? Um, no. <laughs> I was saying that we have seen the interaction with data come leaps and bounds if you just look at gamification and you look at how people are interacting with information through their phones. Um, one of my team was showing, uh, showing me uh, a really nifty reporting tool that is all app-based, that is, is literally an interactive way of uh, reading and receiving information. So I think there is going to be a lot of platforms we can use. Uh, but to, to be able to use them, we have to be open to the concepts, don't we? We have to be open-minded in terms of what we have done in the past and what we need to do differently going forward, uh, which means in some ways getting out of our comfort zone and getting away from spotlight, traffic light reporting tools in Excel and uh, I guess the, the, the typical sort of radar diagram that we use traditionally for reporting. I'm just going to shift the focus of conversation for a moment. Um, I, I have a couple of questions from the audience that I think are worth throwing in at this point. Uh, Jenny made a comment, uh, not so much a question, but it's a comment which I think reflects what we've been discussing, that what we're talking about now applies to a number of disciplines, it's not just safety, it actually applies to a range of other business disciplines as well and what it is is actually the future is less about safety and process and more about leading people. Jenny, it's a great comment and I think some of our discussion now re uh, reflects that that is definitely the case. Um, the question I do want to pose is from Michael, thank you Michael. Uh, and my personal answer, Michael, to this question is yes, absolutely, because I'm a psychologist myself. However, the question is, is there a professional having understanding of psychology in order to better motivate people? Uh, he says, my experience was very technical with little focus on culture and leadership. Uh, this is an interesting one. Before I throw over to Drew and Richard, I just want to say we had a session um, through the SIA conference. We had a Women's Day where we had um, a guy called Gavin Freeman speaking and he was talking about motivation and he basically said, stop motivating because there's an intrinsic motivation and he was talking about a range of other things um, that are more effective. But that's my view. I'd love to hear. Drew, Richard, should we all be psychologists? Andy, you've, you've stolen part of my answer because my immediate thought was that if you have a basic understanding of psychology, it will stop you thinking that the solution to things is to positively motivate people through the power of your clever psychological leadership. Um, I wouldn't say we all need to be psychologists, but there are a lot of practical skills that particularly clinical psychologists get taught that could really benefit anyone in any sort of job that involves leading and working with other people. Uh, one of the very ba basic ones is just active listening skills. We all say that listening is important and everyone likes to think they're a good listener, but most of us really aren't. And those are trainable skills. There are skills that have got some good data behind what works, what doesn't work. 
And there are different modes of conversations that people who've had counselor training fall into, that people who don't have the training stumble around and get awkward or don't start the conversation, that don't know what to say to someone who appears to be unhappy at work. Um, one of the common ones is anyone with counselor training knows that if you're worried that someone's at risk of hurting themselves or others, you just come right in and say it. Are you thinking of committing suicide? Whereas a lot of people are afraid to say that because they simply don't have the background knowledge how to talk to someone. And we see that challenge um, now as people start to deal with mental health and mental illness and the discomfort that many have in having a very open conversation, as you say, about are you OK, um, are you getting the right support, that type of thing. Richard, over to you. Are you going to start a new career as a psychologist? No, hell no. Um, <laughs> I, I, like any profession, if we were homogenous, it would be really bad. I, I think that the the, the skill set that um, sociologists bring to uh, health and safety is important. The skill set that lawyers bring, that operational people bring, that industrial hygienists bring. You 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 name a particular professional group, and they all bring a perspective that is that is important. Um, and I think we've gone through, you know, you kind of look historically about you know, the, the, the profession, if you like, and for many years, the, the most senior role in, in, the, in big organisations was a doctor. You know, the, the, the head of health and safety in most big corporations w was a doctor. And then for a while, it was predominantly organisational psych people, you know, and that was the absolute you know, rich vein of money for the consultants who wanted to do behavioural based safety was when, you know, we're all going to be, you know, the psychology of safety stuff. So, look, it's important and I, I think Drew had the right measured approach to it. There's some skills that, that, that psychology brings that are useful for everyone, but for God's sake, don't everybody run off and become a psychologist because we'll, <laughs> then there's no way any of us will ever get invited to a party. <laughs> Oh, I think Richard is absolutely right. A good analogy might be the group of people who are managing performance of a sports team. You've got your people in the headspace who are interested in the motivational and concentration aspects of sport. You've got your physical movement people who are coaching the exact behaviours and movements. You've got your sabermetrics people who spend all of their time not talking to anyone else, just staring at screens full of data. And then you've got your coaches who need to translate between the sabermetrics people and the sports people because the sports people don't trust either the psychologists or the people who are spending all their time with numbers. They want to speak to someone who's done the sport themselves and knows what it's like. And safety needs people in the equivalent of all of those different roles. Not necessarily within the same organisation, but certainly you don't all want to be one or the other. I'm laughing because I only just realised why I'm never invited to the party and it's because I'm a psychologist. I'm gutted. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question for you, um, uh, and, I'll, and I'll pose it to all three of you actually. It's come from, um, it's come from uh, Bryce and he says, the, the challenge is translating experiences and stories and making sure that they are relevant for an audience that is increasingly interested in data. So how do we bridge the gap between our experiences and the stories we have and potentially an audience that has a different area of interest? People are not nearly as interested in data as they say they are. They're interested in believing that things are backed up by data. Yeah. Your best thing is a good story and then sliding in at the end, oh, by the way, I've got data to back this up. We know from communication of science that it doesn't work the other way around. You don't convince people by throwing the data at them and saying, here's the data I'm right, believe me. Yes. Okay. Amy? So I think especially from a client experience that we've had um, through EY is really around making sure that when you are providing the data and some, depending on the audience, some people prefer to see the data first, but it's actually making sure that you have a really clear story and message that goes with it and really um, bringing in the storytelling element around why the data is demonstrating some insights around whether there are spikes in incidents or they are um, 
typical sites that are having issues. It's being able to really provide that storytelling around it, which actually brings the data to life. And I think sometimes organisations get stuck with just reporting and talking about the data and putting data on a slide, but actually not providing the story or the insights around that, which is the most important thing for an executive to actually, or board or audience to actually understand. So being able to talk the language of the audience. So if you are presenting data to frontline, you want to be able to talk in that particular language so they can understand and you don't just sound like you're someone from a head office. Um, and then being able to change that language around again when we're talking to an executive level too. So being able to talk their language, being able to give stories that provide insight to the data is a really powerful way to ensure that everyone's understanding the message and can ask questions. So storytelling for context, data for fact, and back it up with some data. Richard, digital to make it accessible? Uh, possibly. And the, the first three in whatever order works for the audience that, you that you're talking to. Yeah. So um, I, my view, particularly, I've, I've reported to, to three boards now, three, three ASX kind of list, listed boards. And um, the data really is only to give you kind of context. It's the narrow, it's it's the context and um, and justification and you know evidence of kind of runs on the board. It's the narrative and the strategy that you build around that that the board's genuinely interested in. So we have another uh, question from Cameron. And it leads me into probably the next topic, the future of the uh, health and safety professional. And he says, should we be rebranding our job title? Will we still be health and safety professionals in the future or will we be something else? And I know we touched on this at the very, very start that I think, Drew, you were saying we either change or we won't exist. What do you see as that future state for a health and safety professional? What is our new role or brand? I think I need to build on something that Richard said a couple of minutes ago that there's not going to be any sort of uniformity here and certainly there are very different roles that we could try giving different job titles to except we're already overusing. You know, we have tens of or dozens of different names for safety professional and they mean different things in different organisations in some places a safety manager works on a shop floor in other places, the safety manager advises the CEO. So just trying to shift it into particular job titles I don't think is going to work. But there are certainly very different roles in the people who provide high level strategic advice to boards, the people who provide day to day support, the people who act as information conduits collecting messages from throughout the organisation, either in the form of stories or in the form of collected numerical data, um, processing that, creating messages out of that and passing it back to the workforce or up to the board. Um, that, that's at least three totally different roles that probably require different skills and that don't have a clear career path from one to the other. Okay. Richard? I, I think it's a really good question, but I, the, the point that I would make is that it depends on your, on your understanding of what brand means. So if you think brand is just a label, it, it, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter what, what you call yourself. If you think brand is the, the sum total of the experience that people have with you, the way that you interact with, with others, the quality of your work, um, your ability to kind of take and receive feedback, and the actual activities that, that you do, I do think we need a rebranding. Um, um, but it's not a relabeling. It's actually that we do things fundamentally, fundamentally differently. And I, I hope you're going to get on to John D's question next because I actually think that um, his his question around you know can everybody kind of be well you are because I'm going to segue there. Here we go. Um, uh, it was the next one. <laughs> go there. <laughs> So I think that actually gets to, you know, can everybody be involved in, in digital disruption? My answer is yes, um, because every level and every job is going to get impacted by digital disruption in some way. So go out and find. So be on, be on the front foot. Understand where the, 
the disruption is coming to your industry, understand how, what tools and processes and systems and, and, and things that are there today so you are seen as somebody that's contributing to the change not blocking it and therefore not being you know conservative to use um, you know Drew's words from earlier. Can I just touch on that Richard because absolutely John's question was the next one I wanted to throw in there. Um, people generally get a bit overwhelmed when we talk about innovation as if it's got to be a whole scale radical thing that happens and everyone's got to lead innovation but the truth is innovation can be through our daily habits and smaller changes as well. And the, the first part is giving yourself the freedom to think differently about what you do and how you do it, right? So the, the challenge might be for some safety professionals to actually start to question how they are going about trying to get the outcomes they're striving for, right? And it's a bit of self-reflection and reflection on the processes and systems in place rather than going, oh my goodness, we must have an innovation program and it's got to be really big and it's got to have a whole lot of money behind it. And a lot of the innovations that we're talking about come from self-reflection and might not be costly and might simply be an attitude shift that you need to make in terms of how you're going about your normal day-to-day -day role as well, right? Yeah. Andy, I think that's a really important point that uh, most people spend 50 to 60 hours a week doing the current job they're doing and very little time thinking about how they could be doing that job differently. Um, and the difference between you know, spending six hours a month updating a spreadsheet and taking an hour in order to devise a new way of updating the spreadsheet so it no longer takes you six hours, it, that sort of upfront investment in thinking about what your job is, what you're spending time on, um, one of the simple exercises we ask our students to do is just map out what do you spend your time doing and how much of it is discretionary, how much of it do you do because you think you have to and how much is it do you do just because that's what you've always done and could you take a bit of that and take it away and do something else instead. Amy, you do a lot of coaching for clients and for team internally as well. Your view in terms of people disrupting themselves rather than trying to disrupt the industry, what do you see? So I think from my perspective it's all around almost what you were saying before Andy, it's around really that self-reflection, being able to understand what are some of those challenges and get to the nuts and bolts of it and then coming up with some solutions that aren't groundbreaking but are something that we can do to shift what we're doing. Challenge, you know, I've, I've asked all my clients that I coach and all of my counsellees within EY around, challenge me as to why we do a process. If there's something that is frustrating you, ask me the question, why do we actually have to do this? And keep asking me it until you actually understand why. And then come up to me with the solution. Challenge me around, well, couldn't we do it this way? Or isn't there a better way to do it if we look at using digital? I know we've talked about that a lot today, but is there a digital solution to what we're doing to limit the amount of processes? So Drew, back to what you were saying around the spreadsheet, is there a quicker way to do that that's actually going to give us better insights rather than spending five hours trying to work out the analysis over an Excel spreadsheet? So um, being able to find what the problem is and really identify and problem solve and work with them around what are some of the solutions that we can do rather than sort of going to them with the answer. And I think from my perspective, when I'm working with clients, and again, we see some really great things in the market around health and safety where people are actually engaging with the workforce at the ground level and really understanding what their challenges are. So whilst we're talking about innovation from a safety professional role, we need to also talk and engage the front line around what, what are their challenges, what are they struggling with, because nine times out of ten, they're the ones that are going to have the innovative answer and it's not always a big, it's not always a big shift or change. Well, sometimes it's actually get out of their way, right, and let them get on with it how they need to do it. Richard, you've got a lot of operational experience. I, I'm conscious we've got about 10 minutes and I've got one more question, but before we go there, you've got a lot of operational experience. I'm sure you've heard plenty of times, well, this is the way we've done it because we've always done it that way. From an operational perspective, how have you managed to shift people's thinking when you face that kind of, you know, legacy of, but this is how we've always done it. Um, I've never found that 
to be ubiquitous in industry, right? So I think there's a bit of a myth that there are this this level of management out there that just go, oh, we're not changing. It's all it's all too hard. You know, push back, push back because we've always always done it this way. I think most managers that you talk to are faced with multiple competing priorities, multiply comp competing objectives, and actually are always looking for well, help me change because the pressure is on for me to, for me to deliver. Um, there, are, there are only a handful of people through my career that I can kind of point to and go, you know, they were very happy in, in their box and there are some people that you are never gonna, you're never going to change. But I'd say 98% of people uh, are open for it and it's up to us to be the, the coaches and mentors of that, of that process and help them navigate systems to Amy's point, that often we've created that are just not helpful. They're, they're, they're there to stop work getting done. They're there to um, freeze the system so that it does so that it doesn't actually change. And we've got this layer of management in between that we are squeezing and actually probably being cruel to. Um, yeah, so that's the, I think that's the challenge. It's it's being the coach and the mentor. That's a really good point, and I think in all of this, as we shift. Uh, to whatever the future role is and whatever the future of work turns out to be because of course none of us can be 100% certain, um, a huge part of it is going to be coaching, isn't it? It's a huge part of it is going to be having mentors and coaches help people uh, with whatever areas of weakness they might have or areas of passion where they're not quite sure how to go about and explore the things they're interested in. I'm conscious of time. I, I want to ask one last question and get everyone to answer. Um, and it's really talking about the future, I guess, what we can do to prepare for change. And some of you would have seen we, um, we have a competition, EY has a competition online. It's a really, it's a conversation starter. What would you do, 50 words or less, uh, to achieve a future state, to shift towards where, where the future is? So the same question to you guys. What should we be doing today to prepare us for the future? And Drew, I'll start with you. Uh, I think one of the big risks when we try to innovate in the safety space is we tend to come up with great ideas that people have invented and tried before and we're not actually being innovative, we're being circular. And so preparation for the future often just involves an understanding of how we got to where we are now and having a thorough grounding in the ideas and theories and experiences that have built us up to the present point. But I mean, that's the answer I would give. This is my job in teaching people. So the answer to anything is get an edu education. <laughs> Mind you, your industry is also being disrupted a fair bit. Um, so no doubt how you teach is going to change as well. Notice that we're talking face to face, not via a static recording though. <laughs> Richard, what about you? How can we prepare for the future that is facing us? What should we start doing? I think it goes to a couple of the questions that, 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 that have been asked from the, from the participants. I think it's looking for information and education outside of the traditional channels. So please don't anybody get on Google and search safety. Don't search OHS management system. Um, you know, get on Twitter. We, I asked the question at the last Safety Institute conference, how many people were on, were on Twitter? I think there was 300 people in the room. 15% of people put, put, put their hands up. Come on guys, 21st century, get, get, onto, get onto Twitter. Use that as the conduit into work that's being done around the globe in spaces that are peripheral to what we consider to be, to be safety. So, you know, we talk about artificial intelligence, you know, the search artificial intelligence, digital disruption, you know, data, inter internet of things, search augmented, augmented reality, and then use your skills as safety professionals to think about how you would apply that back in, back in your business. So it's not about, for me, it's not about innovation creating new things at this point. It's, in, it's actually taking things that are being innovated in, in peripheral or tangential areas of, of the world um, and, and using them. Absolutely. I would have to agree with you there, Richard. It's, it's not innovation for innovation's sake. It's what can we grab that's already available, already out there, being used 
I mean, the way that data is being used to look at customer behaviours by retail, we could use to look at employee behaviours from a risk perspective. So what can we take that's innovative and new for us? May not even be innovative in other industries or other business processes anymore, right? Amy. So from my end, I completely agree with, with both of the gentlemen that spoke in front of me, but um, really I think we need to change the language. We need to change how we actually talk about health and safety. We need to actually think about how we can integrate that into business so it's not just completely disjointed and sits off to the side. And I think for us to be able to do that, going back to the role of a health and safety professional, I think we need to have that diversity is really, really important, but broaden those skills out so that we can actually take the safety profession into the next role regardless of what the title is. So we're giving those typical traditional health and safety professionals that have done all the training and are very system focused and moving them into more of that coaching and mentoring role and building their skills up around not so much psychology, but being able to understand the concepts of people and how that's going to change in terms of how we do health and safety going forward. Um, and I think also being able to embrace the technology. So back to what Richard was talking about earlier, make, making sure that we've got the right technology there that's fit for purpose and is really going to help the people on the front line. The only other thing I think is really important going forward is the problem solving area. So making sure we're engaging everyone in problem solving. We're not just coming up with the solution. I think the problem solving point is a key one because I think again coming back to our comment about arts and humanities, robots and problem solving is one thing but humans and problem solving is, is still another. Um, from my view in terms of preparedness and I know Richard and I, we were at a conference again recent, not too, not too far of it though but we spoke about the importance of um, business cases and being clear on what is the arguments for what we're doing. I think one thing that we as safety professionals can do is actually use the terminology, but get in bed with finance. You know, traditionally when I speak to CFOs, they say, well, I don't really have a role in safety and I always challenge them and say, well, actually, you're the best at planning, budgeting, financing, forecasting, using data, coach safety. I think the challenge is now on safety to say, if you aren't in bed with finance, you're missing out because I can tell you now, finance ain't going anywhere. <laughs> they will still be there in some capacity. Surely there'll be some more automated aspects, but but there's a skill set there that we, we we miss that we can easily gain. Everyone has access to their CFO and their finance um, director and things like that. So that would be my 10 cents worth. Um, I'm very conscious of time. We've got two minutes left, so I wanted to uh, thank the audience firstly for being very uh, participatory and providing lots of questions. I'm sorry there were a couple there that we didn't get back to. Um, but I know Richard and Drew and I are all active on social media, unlike the other 285 people at the conference that weren't. So we'll, we'll make sure that we do respond back to your questions when we get offline. Um, I do want to say thank you to the panellists, especially Richard and Drew. Thank you very, very much for your time and your insights and your comments. It's been wonderful to have this conversation with you. I've really enjoyed it. I hope our audience have really enjoyed it as well. Uh, a big, big thank you to EY and the Safety Institute of Australia for allowing us to actually facilitate this series of discussions. As I said, this is the last one in doing Safety Differently series that we've been running this year. If you want to, you can access the previous versions online and this one will also be made available for you if you want to listen back to certain aspects. Um, so contact the SIA if you, if you want to uh, access the webinars once this is finished. And finally, um, hoping that everyone has learned something from, uh, from this uh, episode and from this discussion. We are online. If you want to Twitter, I've lost my little Twitter link. Wait a sec. Give me a moment. I had a post-it note somewhere. Um, here we go. Please do uh, send your questions to EYSAA webinar. We will be actually monitoring that for the next day or two if you have any comments. So chaps, thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. No problems. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, guys. See you later. See you. Bye. Bye.